loving 24 year old with hopes, dreams, and a full life ahead of her. Yet, that full life would not be. Ellen Ainsworth, a lieutenant in the U.S. Army Nurses Corps, died of wounds sustained on February 16, 1944, just shy of her 25th birthday. Five other Army nurses would be killed in action during the Anzio landing in what was called the Half Acre of Hell. The Allied armies were bogged down in Italy trying to break the German defenses at the Winter Line. The Germans held the Rapido, Gari, Leary, and Gari, Gari Liano valleys as well as the surrounding peaks and ridges. Together these features form the Gustav Line. Monte Cassino, a historic hilltop abbey founded in 529 AD, dominated the nearby town of Cassino and the entrance to the Leary and Rapido valleys. The Germans, realizing the historic significance of the abbey, did not use the building itself. Instead, they manned positions set into the steep slopes below the abbey's walls. Now, from the vantage point, the Germans were able to stop any attack the Allies made. So to break through the stalemate, the Allies planned a landing at Anzio, a town on the western coast of Italy. It's located in the Lazio region. Anzio is about 32 miles south of Rome. Now if the plan worked, the Germans would weaken their forces on the Gustav Line and send those forces to repel the Allied invasion at Anzio. If successful, the Allies would be able to break through the weakened Gustav Line, then link up with the forces breaking out of Anzio thereby cutting off the German army's line of retreat. On the other hand, if the plan did not work, Anzio would become a death trap. Now, the original plan called for General Lucian Truscott's 3rd Division to be the American portion of the combined operations. Now, he pointed out, though, to General Mark Clark, the 5th Army commander, that the position was a death trap and there would be no survivors. Clark, realizing the gravity of this, decided to cancel the operation. However, the original plans for the invasion came from Prime Minister Winston Churchill. He decided to revive the plan. The landing at Anzio was a combined British and American operation. The British suffered the same fate as the American GIs did on that hellish beach. Now, the revived plans had the U.S. 6th Corps with General Lucas as the overall commander of the landings. Now, Lucas who was the hero of the Pancho Villa raid on Columbus, New Mexico in 1916, stated in his diary, they will end up putting me ashore with inadequate forces and get me in a serious jam. Then, who will get the blame? The operation has a strong odor of Gallipoli, and apparently the same amateur was still on the coach's bench. That amateur he was referring to was Prime Minister Winston Churchill. See, Churchill had planned the Gallipoli operation when he was first Lord of the Admiralty in World War I. The operation was a complete and utter disaster. The initial landings were on January 22, 1944. They were unopposed, the only exception being that of a half-hearted Luftwaffe strafing runs. By midnight, 36,000 soldiers, 3,200 vehicles had landed on the beaches. 13 troops were killed and 97 wounded. We took about 200 German uh, prisoners had been taken. Now the 1st Division penetrated two miles inland. The Rangers captured the Port of Anzio. The 509th Parachute Infantry Brigade captured Netunino, while the 3rd Division penetrated three miles inland. Operation Shingle, that was the code name for the landing, so far was a success. The Allies had achieved total surprise. The road was open to Rome. However, General Lucas did not exploit this initial success. Lucas only had two divisions on the beach. His intelligence reported he would be facing two to three times as many divisions. Lucas believed he needed to secure the beachhead to avoid being overrun by an overwhelming enemy force. This decision would turn out to be a costly disaster for the Allies. Three days after the landing, Field Marshal Kesselring had the beachhead surrounded by a defensive line consisting of three divisions. The Germans joked that Anzio was basically a self-contained POW camp. 
Now, there was no place that was safe within the Allied beachhead. Every square inch was under enemy artillery fire. There was no place to hide. Now, normally, the Army sets up their evacuation hospitals far enough behind the lines so that they could not be shelled by artillery. On Anzio, that was not the case. The beachhead was about 7 miles deep, 18 miles wide. Troops and supplies poured into the landing zone. To handle the mounting casualties, the Army had to send the evacuation hospitals ashore on the second day, January 23rd. Now, the 93rd Evacuation Hospital was originally set up in the buildings in Anzio, while the 95th Evacuation Hospital was set up in tents in an open area between the American sector and the British sector. The constant bombing of Anzio's harbor, as well as the artillery shelling, made these positions dangerous. They were in the direct line of fire, so Colonel J. M. Huddleston, who was the medical officer basically commanding the beachhead, had to find a safer place to set up operations. The problem was, there was no safe place anywhere within the Allied lines. Huddleston selected an open field about two miles east of Natuno, believing it would be a less hazardous area. At least in the open field, the hospital area would be easily identified by the enemy and would not be targeted. Within three days of the initial landings, the 93rd, 95th, and 56th evacuation hospitals were up and operating in what became known as Hell's Half Acre. Now it has been suggested that since the Germans used the Red Crosses to conceal valuable fuel and ammunition stockpiles, they believed the Allies did the same thing. Therefore, the German shelling of a clearly marked hospital was considered legitimate targets by the Germans. Now the Allies did not set up storage dumps around the hospitals and areas but that was only due to the fact that the beachhead was only 7 miles deep and about 16 to 18 miles long. There just wasn't enough space. So, the front line was so close that if you didn't know the area, things could get pretty dangerous. The website, warfarehistorynetwork.com, article, Angels in All of Grab, relates the following incident about three new nurses arriving at Anzio. Assured at Anzio, three American nurses were looking to report to the 95th Evacuation Hospital in the beachhead after being dropped off by a rattled truck driver. As they walked, they saw British and American troops crawling forward. Lieutenant Hazel Glidewell called out to the soldiers inquiring how to get to the 95th Evacuation Hospital. A sergeant looked at them in disbelief. What in the hell are you women doing here? We're the front line, and you're in front of us. That puts you in no man's land. The nurses were quickly hustled to safety to the hospital in the rear. Now, if you were a nurse at Anzio, you were in the front lines. By the end of World War II, the Army had approximately 59,000 female nurses serving on active duty. All of these women had read and heard the radio broadcast from the Philippines about the heroic efforts those nurses performed. Knowing how dangerous it could be to an army nurse, these women still volunteered. The feelings and attitudes of the women can best be described by this anecdote published by the website warfarehistorynetwork.com. Angels in all of drab. During the landings in North Africa in 1942, Army Nurse Lieutenant Haskell was confronted by a surprised wounded GI. Holy cow! An American woman! Where did you come from? Lieutenant Haskell replied, Yes, Sonny, an American woman, a nurse, and there are more than 50 of us over here to take care of you and your buddies. Then Haskell rushed the seriously wounded soldier to surgery. To be an Army nurse during World War II was an exercise in adaptation. They worked in conditions that would make a modern-day medical malpractice attorney positively salivate at the potential monetary awards they could earn. Now, the Army did not have proper uniform for females working in the forward area, so the nurses had to adapt male uniforms to fit. Combat boots were made for males. They adapted them as best they could. Steel helmets 
or one size fit all. There was no adapting with that item. In other words, they made do with the standard government issue or GI. They never complained. There were approximately 200 female nurses at Anzio in 1944. Despite the hardship, despite the dangers, these women volunteered to do a job. They were not looking for glory or medals. They were trained nurses and the Army desperately needed nurses and the Army needed nurses in Anzio at that time to take care of the wounded GIs. The medical personnel in Hell's Half Acre faced the same dangers as the frontline combat troops they were there to save. When wounded soldiers were transported from the hospital area to the beach for evacuation to Naples, the road they used was under constant enemy fire. It was called Purple Heart Highway. Purple Heart is an award given to soldiers wounded in action against the enemy. Now the unit history of the 95th Evacuation Hospital stated being surrounded by military installations, airfields, artillery, radar stations, gasoline dumps, long-range enemy artillery shells constantly whistled overhead, with one gun being known as the Anzio Express. Most personnel could get no sleep, being awakened most of the time either by the noise of the enemy shells or by the shaking of the ground under them. The unit history for the 56th Evacuation Hospital describes the daily bombings and shellings. On January 30th, the Luftwaffe decided to launch an air raid against shipping in the harbor and offshore. The enemy used glide bombs for that purpose, and one of them landed causing terrific concussion less than 150 yards from the hospital site, causing a large crater. Another special bomb hit an ammo ship, which exploded while several other ships suffered bomb damage and fires. There was much shelling of the shore installations and supply ships in the harbor. Because the hospitals were in the direct line of enemy fire, the situation remained precarious to say the least. Gradually the medical personnel on the beach had become more accustomed to the frequent bombings and shellings, and less affected emotionally during work. When however the shells dropped short they inevitably fell in the hospital area. The 95th Evacuation Hospital unit history stated, the sounds of gunfire, the roar of aircraft, the explosion of bombs and shells, and the fall of flak fragments filled the days. Anzio was not a healthy place to be for medical personnel in February of 1944. It has been stated that wounded GIs would rather stay on the front line than go to the rear for treatment because the rear area was just too dangerous. Now, the unit history for the 56th Evacuation Hospital documented a devastating attack on the 95th Evac Hospital on February 7, 1944. It was late in the afternoon. Lieutenant and Chief Nurse Blanche Sigmund, Assistant Chief Nurse Lieutenant Carrie T. Sheets, Lieutenant Marjorie G. Morrow, and a Miss Esther Richards, an American Red Cross worker, were on duty attending to their patients. Overhead, a friendly fighter was hot on the tail of an enemy plane which jettisons its bombs while trying to escape. Five bombs fell on the site occupied by the 95th EVAC hospital, killing Sigmund, Sheets, Morrow, and Esther instantly, as well as wrecking the large Geneva Convention Red Cross marker, the receiving station, and the pharmacy, and destroying 29 ward tents. Immediately, eight arrived to help recover the bodies of 16 dead and nearly 70 wounded from the debris. Later, more casualties would die from their wounds, bringing the death toll to 26. The wounded were brought to the 56th EVAC for care. Four nurses were wounded during their attack. First Lieutenants Ruth D. Buckley and Fern H. Wingren, Second Lieutenant Mary W. Harrison and Ruby L. Hopi. The bombing of the 95th Evac Hospital and with the major loss of personnel and equipment necessitated its replacement by the 33rd Field Hospital. Now tragedy would strike on their first day of operation. On February 10, 1944, German artillery fire fell in the 33rd's area and two more nurses were killed. Chief Nurse First Lieutenant Gertrude 
Spielhaug and Second Lieutenant Laverne Farquhar were killed instantly before they could get out of their tents and into the slip trenches, which were dug right outside their tents. To reduce the dangers of flying shrapnel from bombing and artillery shelling, the decision was made to have the engineers dig shallow rectangular pits. They were dug as far down as the high water table would allow. The tents were erected in these pits and the walls of sandbags were used to build revetments and blast shields around the tents. Now this helped reduce the casualties within the hospital area except for direct hits and anti-personnel butterfly bombs bursting above them. As this was going on, a constant stream of incoming patients had to be taken care of. Now, the normal peacetime hospital routine of bathing patients, changing dressings, making beds, administering uh, medication, preparing soldiers for transportation was, at, was added to with the additional requirement of calming patients down during air raids and shelling while maintaining an outward demeanor of calm and professionalism. When the nurses were urged to get into their foxholes for their own protection, they responded with, there is not a single one of us who would let this shelling of hospitals chase us off the beach. We are here to stay. In his book, The Greatest Generation, Tom Brokaw relates the experience of Mary Louise Roberts under fire while working in the operating room. German shrapnel started ripping through their surgical tent. We had patients on the table, and we wanted at least to get them off. I said something like, maybe we can keep going before it gets too bad. It went on for 30 minutes or so. We just kept on working. For her actions, she was awarded the Silver Star, along with three other nurses at Anzio. One of those Silver Stars would be awarded posthumously. Sadly, there would be one more nurse who gave her all on that hellish beach. On February 12, 1944, the nurses of the 56th Evacuation Hospital rushed patients to nearby bunkers during a massive artillery bombardment. Ainsworth, along with three other nurses, moved 42 patients to safety. But Lieutenant Ainsworth realized that some medical personnel needed to remain behind at the hospital tent to take care of the wounded that couldn't be moved. So she chose to stay. One of those wounded she stayed behind to help was Private Broadus Giddens. Now Giddens' son did research and he found out what would happen so he made a journey to Glenwood City, Wisconsin in 2022 to pay tribute to Ainsworth. He related his father's story to Eric Lindquist of the Leader Telegram it was published in their March 1st, 2022 edition. 19-year-old Private Giddens was hit by German mortar fire. The explosion destroyed his spleen, a kidney, and his left lung. Giddens walked nine miles to the hospital area on the beachhead. He wasn't expected to live. The nurses stayed with him all night. In the morning, Giddens was still alive, and the nurses convinced the doctors to operate to save Giddens' life. The reason why they didn't operate right away was because they did not want to waste scarce medical resources on a critically wounded man who most likely would die. Now, it was while Giddens was recuperating in the evacuation hospital that his life was saved again, this time by Lieutenant Ellen Ainsworth. German artillery rounds landed outside the tent and a piece of shrapnel penetrated Ainsworth's chest, close to her lungs. Even though she was wounded, Ainsworth continued to treat her patients in the hospital tent. Ainsworth was eventually evacuated. It is alleged that she told her friends as she was being evacuated, the crowds can't do anything to scare me now. Now, despite the best medical care, her condition worsened. Slowly suffocating from internal wounds, Ainsworth died on February 16, 1944. She was just 24 years old. The other three nurses who helped Ainsworth evacuate the uh, mobile patients to slit trenches and air raid shelters were 1st Lieutenant Mary L. Roberts, 2nd Lieutenants Ellen A. Rowe, and Rita B. Rourke. All four were awarded the Silver Star for gallantry. Of the 59,000 Army nurses who served in World War II, 16 died as a direct result of enemy fire. 15% of those killed in action died at Anzio. 
The story of Lieutenant Ellen Ainsworth's sacrifice did not end with the end of World War II. A retired U.S. Naval officer, Sean Winters, Adjutant General of the Naples Monte Cassino VFW Post in Italy, knows Ellen's story well. He believes what Ainsworth did by going back to help the helpless was worthy of the Medal of Honor. Lieutenant Ainsworth distinguished herself conspicuously by gallantry and intrepidity and the risk of her life above and beyond the call of duty. Mr. Winters is working to have Lieutenant Ainsworth Silver Star upgraded to the Medal of Honor. I have attached a link for the VFW Post 12159 Monte Cassino, Naples, Italy Facebook page. Now, if you're interested in finding more, more about the medal upgrade, please visit this Facebook page. The Army and Navy Nurse Corps were the unsung heroes of World War II. The words of Army Nurse Lieutenant Haskell in response to an astonished GI seeing her in a combat zone sums up their contribution to victory. Yes, Sonny, an American woman, a nurse, there are more than 50 of us over here to take care of you and your buddies. That 50 multiplied into 59,000. So, what have we learned from this slice of American history? Well, when you look at that picture of your great-grandmother or great-grandfather in uniform, just remember, they were still kids then, but they went through more hardship and struggles in their life before they were 25 than most of us will ever have to deal with in our lifetime. That is why they are called the greatest generation. Now, I mean, no disrespect is meant towards the men and women who fought for America since the end of World War II. You too are considered great. No matter what a political hack, vote pandering, disgraced governor from a large eastern state said, you also answer the call when needed. You made America great as well. Well, I hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please, Click the subscribe button, ring the bell, leave a comment below, and most importantly, please share this video with your friends if you think they'd like it. Uh, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch my video.